It's my absolute great pleasure to uh, host and introduce today's colloquium speaker, Michi Balbuk. Michi was a graduate student here in our group uh, between 2010 and 2016 or something rather. And he did some really remarkable fundamental work on uh, gravitational effects around neutron stars. Really, really classic work that uh, was uh, became a very, very big part of what the NICER mission used to measure or to constrain the radii of neutron stars. Uh, and for that part of work, part of the collaboration, uh, the entire collaboration, and Michi as part of it, got the Ross Prize of the AAAS this year. Now, Michi did not want to deal with the politics of that collaboration. So, as a postdoc, he went to uh, the Max Planck Institute, MPE, right, um, in um, Munich to be part of Gravity. And Gravity is that uh, experiment that, as Michi is going to talk to us about, measures relativistic effects of stellar orbits around such a safe star. A lot of great work there. And as you know, that group. And in particular, the um, PI of that group uh, saved for that work the Nobel Prize in Physics this past year. And then uh, he, uh, when he finished that uh, work for five years in Max Planck, he now moved to the University of Illinois, where he became a member of the third dysfunctional collaboration, the Event Horizon Telescope. And his, he'll tell us at the end which one is the most dysfunctional. Oh, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this meeting is recorded, right? It's, yeah. Uh, somebody could see that. But uh, he is uh, working uh, there on the general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic simulations and what does it mean for our black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, I find it remarkable, honestly, that Michi has worked really in the depths of the three critical, you know, most important, most remarkable experiments in high astrophysics over the last two decades. So he, if you want to know about any of that, he is the right person to talk to about and I'm looking forward to hear more about uh, galactic center science with gravity and the BLT. So okay. uh, I'll tell you the sound as you talk. All right, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, as uh, Dimitri said, although the affiliation now says University of Illinois and that is uh, where I am now, all of the work I'm going to be talking about is uh, work I did um, at uh, MPE in Gaching in Germany, uh, the infrared group um, working on the on the gravity uh, project there. Um, so um, just to give a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to uh, discuss the stellar orbits in the galactic center. That's sort of the flagship project of the uh, of the gravity instrument. Um, and what we can do by measuring with extremely high uh, precision the positions and motions of stars around the central black hole. Um, in particular, uh, sort of the, the main thrust of that experiment is verifying predictions of general relativity. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what other physics we can do with those stellar orbits, namely um, what constraints we can put on other dark uh, mass components near the black hole. And then I'm going to zoom in even more and talk about emission from the material that's accreting onto the black hole itself uh, in the infrared, because that's where gravity um, can do its observations. So um, the galactic center, I have this uh, kind of lengthy zoom in video um, that's just going to zoom in. Uh, we start by seeing the whole Milky Way, and we're going to zoom further and further into the galactic center. Um, of course, uh, the dark patches that we see here are not that there are fewer stars, it's that there's too much gas and dust that blocks uh, the light from reaching us. So at some point, right around now in this simulation, we suddenly shift to the infrared, uh, where the gas and dust is less opaque, um, so that we can still see the stars. And then we're going to keep zooming in to this nuclear star cluster. Um, and this is kind of stitched together from a bunch of different images images from a bunch of different instruments. Um, and we can keep zooming in further and further until we're left with really just these few stars that are right at the heart of the Milky Way. Um, and these stars are we've now zoomed enough that we can watch these stars as they orbit some dark mass, which, as we all know these days, um, is a supermassive black hole um, with about 4 million solar masses. Um, we, um, everything that I'm going to talk about today um, involves 
uh, observations in the near infrared, um, which is sort of this magic window if you want to observe stars near the galactic center. And the reason it's a magic window is because if you go to any shorter wavelengths, uh, so any higher frequencies off to the right here, extinction just kills you. There's, um, you know, 50 magnitudes of extinction towards the galactic center in the optical. You're never going to see a star there. Um, and the, um, the, if we go to two long wavelengths, so we can observe the galactic center in the millimeter. Uh, this is, for example, what the EHT does. Um, but the problem is that stars aren't very bright at millimeter wavelengths. Um, so this uh, spectrum here, this is just a black body at 10,000 Kelvin. Uh, you can see that the near infrared is sort of in this Goldilocks zone where the stars are relatively bright. We're near the peak of the spectrum. We're still at a relatively low part of the extinction curve. And we're at a part of uh, the spectrum where with uh, an interferometer in the infrared, we can achieve this extremely high resolution and really measure uh, positions very precisely. Um, so this uh, somewhat confusing figure, sorry, um, shows uh, the orbits of about 40. Uh, so 40 stars are plotted here, but we have orbits for about 40 stars um, that we call S stars. Um, and these are the stars where we can actually measure both the, the motion and the uh, acceleration of the stars. And that's enough for us to solve the full, um, for the full orbit. So we get spectra and we get two-dimensional astrometric information that lets us solve for the full three-dimensional orbit of the S stars. Um, and there's about, like I said, about 40 of these stars. Um, and I want to highlight in particular one of them uh, which is the star S2, um, which is the poster child star um, for uh, galactic center science um, because it um, has a period of only about 16 years. So in, a, in an astronomer's lifetime, we can observe the star going around the black hole multiple times. Uh, so we can see the orbit close or not, as the case may be. Um, and it passes very close to the uh, central black hole. So there are stars with slightly shorter periods, uh, but this S2 has a relatively eccentric orbit. And so at its pericenter, it passes within about 3,000 gravitational radii of the, of the central black hole, which makes it a very appealing target uh, for testing uh, general relativity in sort of the strong field regime where normally uh, it isn't accessible to us. Um, so the instrument that uh, we're using to um, make these observations is called the gravity instrument. Um, it's at the VLT in Chile, um, and it is an interferometric instrument. It combines the, um, the light from all four of the VLT telescopes, giving you an effective diameter of about 100 meters. Um, and we're observing in the K-band. Uh, so relatively um, well for near infrared. So we have, uh, we can get down to about 100 micro arc seconds of resolution. And then even better than that, if we all we care about is the position, because we can centroid um, the PSF to much better precision than we can, uh, than we can measure the actual resolution. Um, so uh, this is now gotten rid of all of the other stars and we're just zooming in on the just the S2 orbit. Um, and this is about 30 years of data. Uh, so about, or I'm sorry, it's not 30, it's about 20 years of data. Uh, so not quite two complete orbits. Um, and it's sort of as the uh, instruments get better and better, the precision of the points, the error bars get smaller and smaller. So you can see uh, the first points that we measure are these black points um, in the first pericenter passage around 2002. Um, that was with the SHARP instrument and the NACO. And we had relatively large error bars. Uh, we didn't know the orbit well enough. And so we missed the pericenter passage. Um, and even if we had gotten it, uh, the error bars were so large that we couldn't really do any uh, interesting tests with it. Um, but then um, 
especially so then in the next 16 years, um, the gravity instrument was built, uh, this interferometer, and those are the blue points here. Um, the error bars on uh, these blue points are actually much smaller than the point size themselves. I'll zoom in even more in a second to give you an idea of what uh, the error bars are. Um, and then the red points are infrared observations of the flares from the black hole itself. Uh, so there's a relatively large error bar there, um, and we'll talk about that later. So this is zooming in now even more to just a few days in 2018 um, when we, uh, when the star, so the black dot at the top of uh, the plot is Sagittarius A star, the black hole, uh, the position uh, where we think it's at. Um, and you can see that uh, we can now measure the position of this star changing from one day to the next. So over the course of about two months of observation, uh, from April to June of 2018, uh, we could really track this star. And every night we went and measured the position, uh, we could see the change from the previous night. Um, these points now, the black points, have error bars. They are smaller than the red dots. Um, the red dots are just there to highlight uh, the points, so you can see them. Um, but this is the scale of the error bar that we're talking about. Uh, I don't know if you can see the see that at this resolution yet, yeah, Demetrius. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Why did you then miss the actual periapsis like from 10 to the 24? There's 20 days, and before and after, it's more. Was the prediction error, or was it? No, uh, it was but, not a prediction error. I think it was uh, to do with, um, oh, I guess, um, I don't know actually. So first of all, it's not super important to get the, uh, the, the point at the pericenter, um, especially what's uh, more important is finding the peaks of the, of the radial velocity, um, which aren't at the pericenter. They're slightly before and after for the maximum and minimum. Um, and we did get relatively close. I guess I don't have the, the RV data on here. Um, and second, my guess is that it had to do with uh, the lunar cycle and the time allocation at VLT, uh, which That's contrived to, yeah. Um, this was already, I mean, we were at the telescope um, once a week for, once a month uh, for a week every time, so. Um, yeah, so um, here's what you can do if you um, can measure to maybe tens or maybe 100 micro arc second precision the orbit. And of course, at the same time, we were always taking spectra of the star, uh, which gives us the radial velocity information. Um, so with these three components, you can solve for the full 3D orbit. And you can start asking questions like, how well does the orbit fit to a simple Keplerian orbit? In particular, um, general relativity predicts that as the star, when the star gets very close to the black hole, um, there will be an additional term in the velocity, in the radial velocity measurement, which comes from the fact that the star is now sitting deep in the potential of the, the gravitational potential of the black hole, and it sees a gravitational redshift as it travels uh, to the observer. And so that will manifest as an extra velocity above what we predict from, from just the Keplerian orbit. Um, and so this shows the, the residual of the line of sight velocity uh, in kilometers per second um, through the pericenter passage, which was at 2018, about 0.4. Um, and you can see, so the blue points are all of our data points and the red uh, is the prediction um, from just a simple prediction from general relativity, how much gravitational redshift do we expect to see um, from the source? So this is uh, essentially exactly what we expected. Um, and then uh, the second, the next higher order effect that you can ask uh, whether we can see is in general relativity, we predict that the orbits no longer close. Uh, in a Keplerian orbit, the star will go around on the same track uh, for eternity and just keep staying on uh, the orbit it is, it's on now. In relativity, in, if you add the relativistic correction, that orbit processes each time, just like the precession of Mercury around the sun. 
um, except that here we're at a much higher, uh, we have a much higher rate of recession. Um, so with the fact that now we have uh, more than one complete orbit, for the first time we can measure whether the orbit closes or not, and how much the, uh, the precession, how much relativistic precession there is. Um, so I'm showing this in a maybe not super intuitive way, um, which is the, I've split it up into the RA and deck components of the precession. And again, the horizontal line at zero is if there's no precession, just in a Keplerian orbit. Um, and the red line shows the prediction from general relativity. And we've parametrized this uh, to sort of, to make this a test of general relativity rather than just sort of a measurement. Um, we've parametrized the, what we call this Schwarzschild factor, F, uh, S here, um, which is just a, this is just a, the simplest prescription it, from zero in the Keplerian case where there's no precession to one being the case of uh, how much precession you expect from general relativity. And then we can measure, we can do a fit for this F parameter and ask how well does it, uh, does it match the prediction of relativity? You can see we get an F factor of 0.997, uh, which seems like we've measured to less than a percent, but the error bar is about 14%. So um, yes, question. Uh, does that mean you have to assume the mass in order to test relativity or is mass also something that? No, so this test doesn't, uh, so we measure the mass and the distance to the galactic center independently. Um, but this test doesn't actually depend on the, right, we can, it's an, um, this test is orthogonal to, to the measurement of the mass. So it doesn't, we don't need to fix the mass in order to oh, do this. Oh, I see. Okay. And this is for that S2? Just the S2 star. Yeah, that's the only one that we sort of have a, a full measured orbit to high enough precision that we can do this test. And this this is kind of like a brand new result because I seem to remember when like Andrea Getz was talking about this, it was like more of they hadn't seen they had sort of hadn't seen it swung one way or another as to yeah. This, so this, this is closing or whether it's opening up the way you'd expect. Um, this is so I cited I took this plot uh, from our paper this year, uh, but the original paper um, is from twenty or twenty one, and I don't remember right now uh, which one it is. Uh, so we we measured this about a year ago uh, or a little more um, that we published this paper. And um, obviously, I don't want to say anything uh, unpolitic here. Um, I think we we beat them to this measurement because of the gravity instrument, uh, because we have the the much higher precision. So the Keck telescope is in a better location, and they get better spectra than we do uh, because they have larger uh, mirrors than we do, um, and they're, they just have a better atmosphere. Hawaii is a better site than Parnell. Um, but with gravity, uh, we beat them out on astrometry. Um, so the, uh, the increased precision uh, let us make this measurement. Um, and it's work. in the direction you would, you would Yeah, expect. so this is uh, fully consistent with a, um, a prograde precession, as you would expect from general relativity. And as you can see, it's, you know, it's a, there's a lot of sigma uh, to rule out the fact that, to, to rule out a retrograde procession. Right. Okay. So, um, going to more sort of fundamental physical tests. Um, one of the, uh, so one of the sort of underpinning uh, principles of general relativity is the equivalence principle, um, which you can formulate in a number of ways, but essentially says that physics is the same everywhere in the universe and for every inertial observer. So just because you're moving quickly, if you're in free fall, then your physics experiments should always be the same. Um, and this is relatively difficult to test. Uh, there's been a lot of tests done sort of on Earth laboratory scales measuring, um, doing sort of the same physics experiment over the course of a year when the Earth moves slightly closer to and further from the sun um, and goes into and out of the potential. Um, but there, 
you might expect that if this uh, principle is violated, that it's only violated in sort of the strong field regime close to a black hole. Um, and so we can test one particular aspect of this uh, principle, the local position invariance, uh, which essentially says that uh, if you're in free fall, then your physics can't depend, doesn't depend on how close or how far away you are from a, or your position at all, including how close you are to a black hole. And the handle we have on testing this is um, essentially you want two different types of clocks that you can do the same experiment with as you go into and out of a gravitational potential. Um, and the two types of clocks that we have are two different atoms that we can measure the, the spectral lines from. So for example, if gravity couples somehow to some fundamental uh, nuclear constant, uh, then you might expect that helium is affected differently by a strong gravitational field than hydrogen. And so what we can do is measure, uh, so to speak, the uh, do the same experiment of measuring uh, the gravitational redshift with a helium atom and with a hydrogen atom, and then ask what is the difference that we observe between those two results. Uh, so this difference is the change in wavelength over here, so the fractional difference uh, between the helium and the hydrogen experiment. Um, and the black line, just to guide your eye, is uh, proportional to how deep into the potential of the black hole uh, S2 has fallen. So if there were some coupling uh, such that the helium atom feels the gravitational force in a different way than the hydrogen atom does, you might expect that these red points would be proportional to, uh, to that black line. Uh, but as you can see, there isn't. Uh, so we don't detect any violation. Um, which again, there have been much more precise measurements done um, on Earth, uh, but they are all for much weaker regimes. So this is the strongest field uh, test of the equivalence principle that I'm aware of, at least. Uh, okay, and then um, sort of moving away from fundamental physics, um, we can ask what else can we use these orbits to do? And specifically, um, we can uh, ask, how well can we constrain what else is there in the galactic center? So we know that there is a supermassive black hole that has about 4 million solar masses. Um, but in principle, there could be other non-luminous matter. They're ranging from sort of a smooth distribution of matter in the form of dark matter or stellar mass compact objects, um, all the way up to something very clumpy, uh, like an intermediate mass black hole. So I'm going to lump sort of the dark matter and stellar mass compact objects into one category of things that are relatively smooth, assuming that there's a lot of uh, compact objects, and then the intermediate mass black holes separately. Um, so the smooth mass distribution, uh, we can measure by, uh, so we can't measure it from S2 by itself, but uh, what we can do is ask how consistent is our measurement of the central mass as we, if we measure it with S stars, as we go further and further in and closer and closer to the center. So if there's some smooth mass distribution, then you would expect that the larger S star orbits would feel a larger central mass uh, than the smaller S star orbits. Um, so these three blue points, so the, um, the dark blue point there are the closest S stars, uh, the four closest S stars, um, and the mass of Sagittarius A star measured from just those orbits. Um, and then as we go out, we add more and more S stars. Um, and then uh, we measure the mass from those further out S stars. And the further out S stars, we have not, uh, we don't have a full orbit for, and we don't have as high precision astrometry. So the error bars get bigger. Um, but essentially, it's consistent with that mass being constant. And is not consistent with the mass increasing as you go further out. Um, so we can put an upper limit on the on the sort of dark mass fraction in the galactic center, and we don't detect any additional component. Um, then going sort of all the way in the other direction, instead of this very smooth uh, mass distribution, we can ask how well can we rule out that there's an intermediate mass black hole at the galactic center. This is motivated uh, from sort of a variety of ideas. 
Um, if there are intermediate mass black holes anywhere near the galactic center, just from dynamical friction arguments, you would expect them to sort of uh, accumulate near the center, near uh, the massive black hole. Um, and intermediate mass black holes are often invoked as a mechanism uh, for there's this paradox of youth about the S stars. They seem to be really young, but the distribution of their orbits is very thermalized. And it seems like there hasn't really been enough time for the S stars to interact with each other to thermalize their orbits uh, in the lifetime of the stars. But if you have an intermediate mass black hole that's sort of stirring the S stars as it orbits, then it thermalizes much faster. And it would be a convenient solution uh, to this problem. So what we've done is modeled an intermediate mass black hole um, and taken just the orbit of S2, thrown in a, I think for illustration purposes here, this is about a 2000 solar mass intermediate mass black hole in orange, um, and asked how much does it perturb the orbit of S2? And does it perturb it more than is allowed by the error bars on our measurements? In this case, obviously it is much more uh, than is allowed. So the gray, uh, I'll be showing several of these plots. So the, in all of them, the purple line is S2 that doesn't feel the intermediate mass black hole. So the S2 orbit that we measure as our best fit to the data. And the gray orbit is the S2 that does feel the intermediate mass black hole. And here you can see it gets a strong kick um, and flies out and uh, we would very easily measure this. Um, but the question is, how well can we rule that out? Um, so this, we did a sort of full parameter study um, across all of the orbital parameters for S2, across all of the orbital parameters for the intermediate mass black hole, and then additionally, parameters like the intermediate mass black hole mass, the mass and distance of Sagittarius A star, and there's a velocity calibration. I don't want to look at this corner plot any more than necessary, so let's zoom in on um, on just one corner of it um, to uh, convince ourselves that our fit is valid and that we've, uh, we've sampled the parameter space uh, sufficiently. Uh, this is the mass distance relation of the, of the central black hole. Um, so we recover the 4 million solar mass mass and about 8 kiloparsec distance of Sag A star, even with our additional parameters of the intermediate mass black hole. Um, and yeah, we can talk about the, uh, the posterior sampling and uh, how that worked if anybody's interested. But um, so let's just look at an example um, of an orbit. So this is about a 2000 solar mass intermediate mass black hole um, that is orbiting Sagittarius A star at the same time as S2 is um, and is not ruled out by our data. So the S2 orbit is not perturbed to a great enough degree that we would be able to, to detect that uh, this all falls within our error bars. I will say there is no intermediate mass black hole model where the intermediate mass black hole uh, perturbed S2 gives us a better fit than when we don't have an intermediate mass black hole. Um, so we haven't found an intermediate mass black hole. I want to say that very clearly. But the question is just how big of an intermediate mass black hole could still be hiding that we wouldn't have seen so far. Um, so, so you just you built like a parameter <laughs> space basically with all of the S2 parameters and then just a hypothetical yeah, and then we just, of, of, you know, totally unspecified. Exactly. So the intermediate mass black hole orbit can be anything. Yeah, just yeah. basically it could be anything. Yep. Um, and um, this slightly messy uh, posterior plot is the result. Um, it seems to rule out uh, small orbits with high masses. Um, and then as you get out to slightly larger orbits, so this is uh, the semi-major axis of the intermediate mass black hole orbit in arc seconds, um, where 0.1 is about the size of the, um, of the S2 orbit. So um, for reference, 
Um, so at very small orbits, uh, we can rule out anything below about 1,000 or even 500 solar masses. Um, but at larger uh, values, we get a two signal limit of about 4,000 solar masses. Of, uh, so you can hide sort of a surprisingly large 4,000 solar mass black hole in the galactic center without disturbing the S2 orbit to a degree, um, to a degree that you would see. Yes. What are the resonances? These resonances? Here? Oh, I mean, I call them resonances. But you know what I mean? Like, uh, why, why does why is there a high posterior there? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we can, I have a, a various slices of the posterior that I can show you later and it is extremely complicated. Um, and my understanding of why it's so complicated is it has to do with where exactly the intermediate mass black hole is when S2 goes through its carry center passage. And if they are on opposite sides of Sag A star, then you can put almost whatever mass intermediate mass black hole you like there. And if they're on the same side, then even a hundred solar masses will perturb the orbit immediately. Um, and so, and that distance at the carry center doesn't translate very well into any of the parameters that we use to actually specify the orbit. And so the posterior is, is very complicated and has lots of local maxima and minima um, that I don't pretend to, to understand very thoroughly. Like so. a period ratio to two, three, one for like some small number. Product. No, unfortunately, unfortunately not. Um, I tried to find that simple relation and could not. Um, okay, so these are, uh, this is just um, sort of a sampling of intermediate mass black holes with more than about a thousand solar masses. So I just chose some massive ones um, that are allowed uh, in the space. And you can see they, um, they tend to cluster into these families. And really the family that is most allowed is this um, small orbit intermediate mass black hole that's sort of in counter time to S2, that every time that S2 comes, uh, came to the pericenter in the last few decades when we observed it, happened to be on the far side away from, from Sagittarius A star. Um, okay. I'm going to skip over the large orbits um, and just say that the next question you could ask is how stable is this configuration? Um, putting an extra few thousand solar mass object in uh, to a three body problem is going to be chaotic. Uh, eventually, something will be perturbed and possibly kicked out. It seems unlikely that, you know, S2 was captured in a three body interaction in 1910 and was on some uh, high velocity star orbit uh, before then. So uh, we ran, we took uh, sort of 60 orbits. So the problem is that this three body calculation is very expensive uh, with full GR when you want to run it for longer than 20 years. Um, so we chose 60 orbits um, of this small, uh, from these sort of a representative sample um, of these families of orbits that are allowed um, and ran them backwards for a million years and asked was there a catastrophic three body interaction that kicks out S2 during that time? Um, and it seems like most of them do have a catastrophic interaction, but there are still some that don't. So uh, all of them affect the S2 orbit to some degree over the past million years, which is normal. And we expect that this is one of the reasons we invoke intermediate mass black holes is to sort of jiggle the orbits around and help in verbalizing them. Uh, but there's a relatively sizable fraction that don't catastrophically disrupt the whole system, uh, which we would say are still allowed. Um, and again, let's skip over uh, the large orbits, which are less well constrained, um, and say just that there's a small part of the parameter space that's left at the end of the day, uh, which is intermediate mass black holes up to about 2,000 solar masses on this relatively specific. Uh, type of orbit. We're left with only this kind of, all the orbits are very similar to each other on this one specific family uh, that happened to be so, just so aligned that our observations can't say anything about it. So I would say this is now the only place left for an intermediate mass black hole to hide. Um, and of course, 
if we get more observations, particularly by the time we get to the next pericenter passage of S2, I would say we'll probably be able to rule out all of these orbits to a much, uh, to a much smaller mass as well. Is there an intuitive reason why the, the, re the ones that are still, you can't rule out are all near the closest approach? Um, and not like be on the other side? You mean not like up here? Um, I don't know if there's an intuitive uh, reason. No, um, my no. I guess I could I could speculate, but I don't think I I don't think there's a strong reason that I can give you. I think it's because yeah. I'm, I'm kind of guessing it's because you want the intermediate mass black hole to be outside of uh, the star orbit when the star comes. Closer. Yeah, but I think I was about to say that, but I think uh, that that isn't necessarily necessary, right? As long as if the intermediate mass black hole were at its apocenter when S2 comes through the pericenter, as long as, right, as long as they do this, it might still be, you need to just maintain the separation, but maybe that isn't possible with the different orbital speeds. So yeah, maybe that's true. Well, dimensional orientation of the orbital planes. Yeah, that's obviously impossible to see uh, from this this plot. And uh, I don't know off the top of my head, I can't I can't hold my hand. I can I have all the data for the orbit. So we can if you have your favorite 3D visualization software, we can we can look at it. If they have a line. Uh, if the if the orbital planes were I think they are they are not aligned in orbital plane. I think there is a there is a angle of the orbital plane. But I don't know, for example, if all of these are all in the same orbital plane. So. Other questions? OK. Um, in that case, let me, we've already said all these things. So let me move on to um, zooming in even further um, to the emission from the black hole itself. So this is the final few frames of the movie I showed you at the beginning of the talk, um, showing the S star orbit. And if you look very closely, uh, there is one uh, blob of light that doesn't move in this, uh, in this movie um, and just blinks on and off in place. Um, and that is in fact the black hole itself, um, which also emits infrared light from the material that is accreted onto it. Uh, it has flares, it's highly variable. Um, and so when it's bright, we can observe that as well. Um, in fact, Sagittarius A star emits at all the frequencies of light that we can observe it at, uh, presumably also emits at like the optical, just again, too many magnitudes of extinction to the galactic center, so we can't see it. Um, but uh, we can observe it all the way from the radio through the submillimeter. We can observe it again in the near infrared. And then we also see it all the way out to the X-ray uh, where it has extremely bright flares. Um, we, the, it's variable at all of the wavelengths that we observe it at. And it seems sort of that the degree of variability increases uh, the higher energy wave, uh, light you observe it in. So it's variable at, you know, a, 20% level in the millimeter, it's about 100% fluctuation in flux at the infrared, and then x-ray, you can see brightenings of many hundreds time, of times. Uh, we don't, uh, so probably um, the, there's sort of various processes that are invoked to explain this emission. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on the infrared. We think that the infrared is probably synchrotron emission uh, from relativistic electrons close to, to the black hole. Um, we can constrain some of the properties of this emitting region just from sort of back of the envelope arguments. Um, if you look at how quickly uh, a flare can brighten, you can make an argument that that has to be less time, uh, that has to be more time than the light crossing time of whatever region that is, that is causing the flare. All the different parts that are flaring at the same time have to talk to each other. Um, and so we know that the infrared flares have to be coming from a region that is uh, less than about two and a half or three Schwarzschild radii in size. Um, 
we can, from energetic arguments, we expect that these flares are probably powered in some way by some mechanism by the magnetic field. Um, and if you ask how much energy is available in the magnetic field uh, to power the flares, the magnetic field is really only strong enough uh, to give us the infrared flares that we see close to the black hole. So within maybe 20 short field radii conservatively, do you have a strong enough magnetic field uh, to, power, to power the, the flares? Um, and then, as I said, uh, we see that the, the um, infrared flares are linearly polarized. And we think that that means that they come from uh, synchrotron emission of relativistic electrons. So what can we do with gravity? Gravity measures the position of things with high precision. That's uh, what it does. And when we point gravity at uh, Sagittarius A star, uh, we see that the position of the centroid position of this infrared emission seems to change over the course of an infrared flare. So this is about a half hour observation of a flare um, in the near infrared. Um, and you can see that over the course of the flare, we start in one position, and then we seem to be going around in a clockwise loop on the sky. So something moving around a black hole, what's the simplest model that we can use? Um, we wanted to come up with some, just the simplest sort of toy model of, uh, of what this motion is um, in an attempt to say anything about the parameters of the emitting region. Um, so we just said, let's forget about the emission process where the light is coming from. We're just gonna put a hotspot uh, near the black hole, um, let it light up in some way that we are agnostic about. Um, and then we're just going to let that hotspot orbit around the black hole on a Keplerian orbit, which we know is a simplification and probably wrong. There's all sorts of MHD effects going on. Um, but this model is simple enough that we can calculate thousands of different uh, models we can, we did the full ray tracing. So gravity is strong near the black hole. So that's an important component that we don't want to leave out, uh, which is the relativistic effect on both the photons and on the orbit itself. Um, and so we're reduced to only a handful of uh, sort of parameters in our model. How far away from the black hole is this hotspot orbiting? What's the inclination with respect to the observer? And then a few sort of nuisance parameters of where do you start the black hole? What position angle uh, is, the, um, is the orbit at? And uh, we did this all with the Nero code, um, which lets us, as I said, calculate these sort of fully relativistic orbits and does the full ray tracing. So this is a um, you know, highly spinning black hole uh, with a, you can see the lens tearing precession of the hotspot. This is for illustration purposes only. Um, the, the actual fits to the data aren't this relativistic. And it gives us a light curve as well from just the Doppler boosting. Yeah. A question about the cloud model that you, mm -hmm. uh, does the cloud when you simulate it just naturally stay kind of near its, you know what I mean? Or does that, is, uh, I guess, how did you simulate that cloud? Was it like a bunch of point particles? Or? So uh, we, for sort of the simplest thing, uh, it's just a single point, uh, it's just a single geodesic that we calculate and we assume that everything stays on that geodesic. Um, I also did some calculations where I let everything shear out because uh, you would expect the things sort of closer to the black hole to orbit mm -hmm. more yeah. quickly and over the course of orbit. All of the gravity observations are only sort of partial orbits. Um, over the course of half an hour or so. So you would expect that shearing not to be too significant. Um, but we did, we did do some, some calculations of how much shearing you would expect and how much that would affect the results. Um, so these are the three best uh, flares that we could observe uh, during, so these are 2018 flares um, and then observing flares and their positions got much harder in 2019 and 2020. Uh, I'm happy to discuss why uh, later. Um, 
But the upshot is that we have these three flares from 2018 where we could measure the positions very well. Um, and in particular, so uh, there's the one, the July 22nd flare, which really looks convincingly like there is a, a loop motion on the sky. And then there's two more sort of marginal cases, July 28th and May 27th, uh, which are consistent with a fit um, with the same uh, roughly parameters. So also prefer fits with clockwise motion on the sky at roughly the same radii and uh, consistent inclinations. So the advantage of our model is that it's simple enough that we can run over the whole parameter space and ask what are the uh, constraints we can put on the parameters, uh, specifically the radius and inclination of the orbit um, for all three sources here. So you can see all three uh, flares prefer a clockwise direction on the sky as indicated by the fact that uh, they all prefer an inclination greater than 90 degrees. A greater than 90 degree inclination is a clockwise orbit and a less than 90 degree inclination would be a counterclockwise orbit. And the radius, uh, so this is not, again, the radius of the hotspot. This is the orbital radius, uh, so the distance from uh, the black hole at which the hotspot orbits. Uh, and all of them is somewhere between, I would say, 7 and 10 uh, gravitational radii, maybe 5 and 10 gravitational radii for, um, for May 27. Um, so then we can say, OK, let's assume that all of these are manifestations of the same accretion flow and should have the same properties. So they should have the same inclination and same radius, although we still let them start at different points in, in uh, because we don't know where in this accretion flow the, the, uh, the hotspots arise, the flares start. Um, so then we can stack the three uh, constraints and say, if we force them all to be consistent, uh, what constraints do we get? And that means that we get a much tighter constraint. So between about eight and 10 um, gravitational uh, radii um, and between about 120 and 160 degrees inclination. Uh, so preferring more face on orbits. And then sort of the other way we can slice this posterior space is along the inclination and position angle, where again, the inclination angle as before is constrained between about 120 and 160. And then we have two uh, different maxima in the position angle, uh, which is easily explained by the fact that if you rotate this ellipse 180 degrees, you get the same ellipse out again. So we can't tell between those two, uh, between that symmetry. Um, and this is interesting. Um, because that lets us put uh, on the sky the angular momentum of the accretion flow. If we assume that this hotspot is in the accretion flow, shares the same angular momentum. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you in a second where that, uh, where that falls. But uh, there's this uh, clockwise disk of stars um, that lives in this pink blob up here um, in this this is line of sight and uh, I don't know by what angle we call this position angle um, along the x-axis so there's a bunch of stars that live on this on this clockwise disk um, and I'm going to put that pink point onto the plot I just showed you and it seems like it lines up pretty well with uh, the maximum that we find which, again, this is not at all conclusive. Uh, obviously, the error bar here is very large. But it seems interesting because one of the frequent uh, explanations for the material that we see accreting onto Sag A star is the wind from the massive stars uh, that gets sort of uh, funneled to the smallest radii. And it seems like uh, the angular momentum of the hotspot that we measure with gravity seems consistent with the angular momentum of the of these clockwise disk of stars. Um, OK, this is the question you asked about shearing. Um, we did this calculation 
Um, and essentially, the conclusion was that if you make the hot spot too big, then it shears out and the centroid sort of spirals in. So really what this gives you is an upper limit on the size of the of the emitting region of the hotspot. If it, uh, we can say that it has to be smaller than a certain value, but it's a very weak constraint. Uh, you can see here that even the two sigma limit uh, is you know seven gravitational radii, which is already too big to, to really be very interesting. Oh, I was curious. Yeah. Uh, would, would you be able to speculate, um, you know, uh if you're to add mhd effects would that you know cause it to stay more clumped together longer or shear faster um i would expect uh well it depends on uh your what your mhd parameters are right if you have a strong magnetic field that I would expect that uh, the field would thread the plasma, right? And then you would not be able to stretch it out as much and everything would just follow the field lines more or less. Um, if you have a much weaker magnetic field, then the magnetic field follows uh, the gas and then, uh, and then you can do this more of this stretching. So I think there's not a sort of simple answer. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so then we also um, get a constraint from the Doppler beaming. Um, so given that we now have, if we believe this, this orbital interpretation, we have the motion of the hotspot and we know how much uh, during what parts of the orbit, how much uh, the spot is moving towards us or away from us. And from that, we know how much uh, brighter or fainter the spot is appearing just from the Doppler boosting. Um, and so what we've done, so these are the light curves. Um, the intrinsic light curves that we measure um, are the solid lines here. And then we can ask, okay, what if we remove the, our expected Doppler beaming from the orbits that we fit to the centroid motion? Um, and we get the, the dashed line. Um, which would give us then sort of the intrinsic emission uh, of the flare itself. So based on just the physical processes, if you're in the frame of the flare, this is the, the light curve that you would see. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's a lot of uh, things I could say about polarization, but I just want to mention that we also measure the polarization of this, uh, of the source during the flare. And the polarization angle changes significantly over about the same time scale as these astrometric uh, orbits that we see. Um, we can do forward fitting. There was a graduate student in our group, Alejandro Jimenez Rosales, who's now a postdoc in the Netherlands, um, who did all of the polarization modeling for the flares um, and finds that these are also consistent with. Um, a hotspot moving through a uh, vertical with uh, error bars, uh, so a strong magnetic field um, over the course of, of the lifetime of the flare. Um, so if we put all of those things together, um, then we uh, get this picture uh, where the astrometry constraints, the blue uh, blob is what I showed you earlier. Uh, the constraints from the motion itself. And then we get various constraints uh, from the polarization, the period of the change in the polarization angle. Um, if we assume that that period corresponds to the orbital period, um, the fact that the polarization seems to make a loop in the QU plane um, gives us a constraint. And then if we add the constraint that uh, the flares that we see uh, seem to not be consistent with a Doppler boosting greater than a factor of about two and a half. Um, and that means that we need to be in this sort of not super edge on regime. Um, it looks like all of these constraints combine uh, to give us a relatively consistent picture of a more or less face on, so lower inclination um, orbit at between eight and 10 
gravitational radii from the black hole. Okay, uh, that's all. Uh, just to summarize, uh, from observing the S stars, um, we can do various tests of strong field gravity, um, measuring the gravitational redshift, measuring the precession of the pericenter, uh, doing tests of the equivalence principle, and we can put constraints on the amount of uh, dark mass that you have at the galactic center, both in the form of a smooth mass distribution and in the form of an intermediate mass black hole. Um, and then zooming in and looking at the emission from uh, the black hole itself from Sagittarius A star, uh, we can sort of constrain where the infrared emission is coming from by looking at this uh, motion of uh, the centroid during flares and measuring the polarization, um, the polarization changes. So thanks, I'll take any questions. up before we start the people that are looking at us. Uh, shows everything. Okay, whatever. So I have my settings. Well, first of all, any questions from the audience here. We've had plenty of questions, but we can take some more. Tyler. Uh, I'm sorry if I might have missed this, but do you guys plan on using the other S star orbits um, to, I don't know, maybe refine the type of simulations you guys did? Yeah, so um, yes and no. Um, there's the problem with most of the other S star orbits is they have periods of, you know, 80 years or 100 years. And so uh, in terms of tests of general relativity, you're just never going to get to the point. And most of the S stars don't come as close to Sag A star as S2 does. Um, so most of them are kind of not extremely useful for that. Uh, where they are useful is for these consistency tests, right? If you uh, measure a different mass with orbits that are further out than are further in, then that means that either there's some dark mass component or something that we haven't understood. Um, and what is an ongoing project is looking for new, uh, presumably fainter stars that are closer in and come even closer to the black hole. Um, because if we can, uh, so all of the S stars uh, that I've shown you, um, are massive stars, they're O and B stars. And we expect that there should be less massive stars in the galactic center as well. Um, and if we happen to find one that's bright enough to be observable, that has a smaller orbit than S2, then that would obviously be extremely valuable uh, because all of the effects get bigger the, the closer in you go. To, to look for those stars, are you thinking about uh, next generation telescopes or? Uh... So there's, uh, there's some work uh, already going on with just, uh, so all of the measurements of the stars that I've shown you um, have been uh, predicated on knowing roughly where the stars are. And then you can uh, point the fibers at the star and at a reference and then measure the position of those stars. And if you want to do sort of a blind search for new sources, then you have to go to a different regime and do imaging of the whole field, which is complicated in interferometry. Um, this is something that uh, that is ongoing. Uh, there's already been some work just from the gravity data. Um, we've already discovered one new star um, in the, a very faint star in the sort of extremely uh, close to uh, the closest Sagittarius A star, which we think is behind uh, or in front of the black hole. So it isn't actually physically very close to it. Um, so there's some work still to be done of just imaging and figuring out how to optimally image uh, the, the gravity data. Um, in terms of next generation telescopes, there aren't really any on the immediate horizon that are going to be able to do this better than gravity um, because uh, you, uh, so for example, ELT um, is going to have a much bigger aperture, of course, but uh, isn't an interferometer and so it doesn't have the same resolution 
and you're confusion limited in the galactic center. And so it really, it scales as, I think it's uh, diameter to the sixth, is that right? Um, so gravity already beats uh, how the, how well the ELT will be able to resolve the individual stars at the galactic center. So we'll need to wait for the fabled space-based interferometer or something to, to really. Thank you. I think Phil has a question from yeah. online. Hi, Mihi. Great, um, great work and great talk. Thank you for that. Um, my question is about the astrometric precision that you get with gravity. And the reason I'm asking um, is you mentioned that the black hole position is determined separately per flare when you do these fits. And um, at the end, um, the position that you determine for the black hole seems to be offset from one another for the, for the three flares that um, you yeah. were showing. Is that comfortably within the astrometric uncertainty of gravity? How do you, what is the real sausage making there? And what is it that you achieve and trust? And yeah. are you okay with the black hole being in different positions? Yeah, um, I know the motivation behind this question. Uh, yep. because, of course. Does uh, it have to be orbits? Can it be yeah. rotating around something else? Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, you yeah. and uh, David and Demetrius, and I don't know who else had this model of uh, the, uh, this being in the in the sort of jet either in front of or behind the black hole. Um, and I think my uh, I haven't done, I haven't done, and I should, uh, but I haven't done the uh, rigorous statistical analysis. My impression is that you could still comfortably be maybe slightly uncomfortably uh, just be centered on the black hole and not uh, not have a statistically significant offset. But I think it's it's a little borderline. So I think uh, I think you would be mildly uncomfortable with that interpretation. Um, but not, you know, it's not a five sigma offset for sure. Okay. What what do you use to to achieve the astrometric precision that you get? So uh, what you um, what we're measuring, gravity can only measure separations between sources, right? You point the fiber at, you You have two fibers, you point one at, at one source, you point the other at the other source, and then you measure the interference between those two, and that gives you the separation. Or in the case of 2018, both Sagittarius A star and S2 were close enough together that they fell in the same fiber pointing, and so we could directly measure the ringing of uh, one against the other. Um, so all you get, sort of the global position of both of those is uncertain. Um, and what you get is the separation vector from one source to the other. That's the, that's the direct product that you're fitting. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. One last question from Andrew. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, hey, thanks, Mickey. Um, so I was, um, I was wondering, you mentioned for some stability calculations that they were costly because they, they were done in full GR. Um, and I guess I was, I was wondering that, um, you know, why that was necessary and why like post-Newtonian to either first or, or higher order um, uh, wouldn't be good enough. Yeah, so I think uh, post-Newtonian <laughs> is fine. Um, in fact, uh, so we checked, uh, You've caught me out, and uh, the the full runs that I did were in fact post Newtonian, and we checked them against uh, GR. So you're right, um, but even and maybe I know uh, you are probably it's not my goal. Yeah. Um, you are probably more of an expert on n body uh, orbital runs than I am. So maybe you can recommend something. Uh, but even with just a post Newtonian approximation, running these out for a million uh, years. Uh, was expensive enough that we couldn't do the full uh, the full posterior sampling. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And the, the other thing you made me wonder is, of course, the precession that was measured. That's of course very well known in the solar system. But as far as I know, the gravitational redshift of uh, Mercury is not something that can be measured. I guess it's a lot easier to measure the accumulated position of Mercury than its velocity. 
certainly have never heard of anybody measuring Mercury's gravitational redshift. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that that's, you know, it seemed like it was comparably difficult for you to measure the, those two effects that they came within a year of each other, but obviously for the solar I mean, the, the redshift was definitely easier, uh, but, but easier. Yeah, it was. Okay, so it's the other way around. That's interesting. Because they, they're both V over C squared, right? You're just measuring different things. Uh, yes, but the um, the uh, the precession depends on how long of a lever arm you have on your astrometric precision, right? So if you right if you have to measure the previous orbit to notice how the present orbit has shifted, and our precision gets worse and worse the further back you go in time. And so when you're comparing to NACO data from 2006, uh, then the error bars are much larger. And so, um, so the, it took us longer. We had to keep measuring the position with gravity further and further before we could detect that statistically significant. It's helpful to measure the profile of the ocean. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the effect Okay, uh, really quick. Yeah, really quick. I'm sorry, I just, what you were talking about, the redshift. Mm -hmm. Um, DSM could not, uh, you know, with a monotone from, uh, say, Messenger or that be Colombo, which is on its way there, would not be able to uh, provide you what you needed. Uh, sorry, you're going to have to. For Mercury, you mean? Well, so, so, so you're talk I'm talking about a gravitational redshift, and you'll have a spacecraft, you know, in orbit. We've already had one there for a long mission. Yeah. And, Deep Space Network has exquisite um, accuracy for ranging, timing, what have you. I mean, you know. Yeah, I guess I don't actually know sort of the status of gravitational redshift measurements in the solar system, um, but I know most of these relativistic effects have been measured to much higher precision than we can do with SAG A star. The difference is just that we're doing it in a much stronger field regime. Um, so the hope is that there's some violation of GR that only manifests itself uh, at the at the most extreme limit, um, and that that's what we'd be sensitive to. No, I, I just woke up when you were talking about Mercury. <laughs> okay, so let's thank Michi for a wonderful talk. <laughs>